105 millimeter howitzer, the primary supporting weapon of the infantry. Combined simple construction with tremendous striking power. The rate of fire is from two to four rounds per minute, and it throws a 33 pound explosive projectile nearly seven miles. A solid base for firing is provided by its weight of 4,260 pounds. Yet the weapon can be towed at 30 miles an hour and set up ready to fire in three minutes. There are 36 105 millimeter howitzers in the infantry division, 12 of them to each field artillery battalion. Let's examine this howitzer from the ground up and see the why of each part. Here it is stripped down to the bottom carriage, which provides the firing platform. It consists of the trails, wheels, axle, and the equalizing support on which the top carriage and the entire howitzer mechanism rides. This equalizing support is connected to the axle by a heavy pin. Gib bearings guide the support as it tips up and down, pivoting on the pin. If the trails are level, the support on which the howitzer rests will remain level even though the wheels are resting on uneven ground with as much as a 10 degree slope. This is because of the three point suspension provided by the two trails and the support. The two wheels and the axle on which the support is pivoted thus form only one point of suspension. The top carriage rests on the support to which it is connected by a pintle. This top carriage swings right and left on the support, pivoting on the pendle. With the support level, the top carriage, which rests on the support, will of course also be level. This means that the howitzer itself is cross-leveled and ready for action. The tube and the recoil mechanism are held in position by the front yoke of the sleigh. This mechanism slides back and forth on the rails along the sides of the cradle. Thus the whole assembly, consisting of the tube, recoil mechanism, and the breech, is firmly held in and based on the cradle. Now, with an understanding of the major assemblies of the weapon, let's consider the job for which it was designed and the job in which you share. First, you must get it on the target. It is swung to left or right by the traversing mechanism through a range of 45 degrees. When you rotate the traversing hand wheel, it rotates this worm, which fits into the teeth of the traversing rack. Thus, when the hand wheel is turned, the worm moves this rack bolted to the top carriage and so causes the top carriage which is pivoted on the pintle, to swing right or left. Turning the traversing hand wheel in the clockwise direction swings the muzzle to the left. And of course, turning the wheel in a counterclockwise direction swings the muzzle to the right. The howitzer's muzzle is lowered or raised by the elevating mechanism. For direct fire, the tube can be depressed as low as minus five degrees. For indirect fire, over mountains or other obstructions, it can be elevated to 65 degrees. This stick is placed at the tipping point to show that the cradle, which mounts the howitzer tube and recoil mechanism, is not supported at the center of gravity. Instead, most of the weight is forward of the trunnions on which the cradle tips. How is that unequal weight balanced? That's done by the equilibrator, two strong springs, one inside the other, connecting the rear of the cradle with the lower part of the top carriage. The spring is so adjusted that it equalizes the unbalanced weight pulling upon it and enables you to elevate and depress the muzzle with very little effort. Notice that the springs are pulling down at the rear of the cradle and contract and expand, balancing the howitzer, 
The mechanism that elevates and depresses the howitzer is an interesting transfer of power. To begin with, there are two elevating hand wheels, one on each side of the cradle. Suppose you were using the left hand wheel. As it turns, it rotates a shaft that crosses under the cradle. On the other side, a bevel pinion meshes with a bevel gear. We have removed the cover to show how the power is received from across the cradle and sent up alongside the cradle. The bevel gear and its shaft are connected by a flexible joint to the shaft running up to the right hand wheel. Here another bevel pinion meshes with the bevel gear, causing the hand wheel to turn. Now let's remove the right hand wheel for a minute to look at the bevel gears inside the cover. We can also see how the flow of power continues through the housing to the flexible joint here. Then the power continues up alongside the cradle to the worm shaft. Here again, we've removed the cover to show the worm carrying the power, meshing with the worm wheel, and turning this shaft. The shaft is mounted on tapered roller bearings, one on each side of the cradle. Two pinions on the shaft mesh with the two elevating arcs. As the shaft rotates, the pinions climb up or down the elevating arcs, which are bolted to the top carriage, and the howitzer is elevated or depressed. Loading and firing is getting down to the real business of any weapon, so it's worth a lot of any soldier's attention. It starts with opening the breech block. Pressing down on the operating handle unlatches it. Swing it to the right and rear. An arm on the handle pulls the crosshead through the groove cut into the top of the breech block and so opens it. We'll open the breech block again to see what's happening in the breech ring. The U-shaped end of the breech block moves over until it is unaligned with the howitzer bore. To demonstrate loading, we use a dummy round. The breech block, in closing, pushes the round firmly into place and holds it there. The round is ready to be fired. To fire, the lanyard is pulled. It passes through a pulley on the firing shaft and draws it back. The pawl pulls back the arm attached to the trigger shaft. And now that we've reached the trigger shaft, which runs through the breech block into the firing lock, let's stop and see what happens there. The firing lock fits into the rear of the breech block, so centered that the firing pin will act through a hole in the front of the breech block to strike the primer of the projectile. When the trigger shaft has been removed, the firing lock can be rotated out of the breech block and we can see how the trigger shaft fits into it. This is a working model of the firing lock. Look it over. That trigger shaft we were talking about enters a square hole in the base of the trigger fork. Here is the fork on the working model. This is the firing pin with its holder, held in the ready position by the sear, which is pressed up by the sear spring. When the lanyard is pulled, the trigger shaft moves the trigger fork forward, forcing this sleeve forward and compressing the firing pin spring against the firing pin holder. As the sleeve slides forward, it also forces the sear down, releasing the firing pin holder, which with the compressed spring behind it, jumps forward and drives the firing pin against the primer, firing the charge. You've probably been following not only the firing action of the mechanism, but also the way it returns itself to the ready position each time. The firing pin spring does that. The compressed firing pin spring forces the sleeve back. And the sleeve 
pressing against the top of the trigger fork, pushes it back. The trigger fork carries the firing pin holder back with it until it engages the sear. Of course, the spring is exerting pressure in two directions. At this end, it is pushing against the top of the trigger fork. At the other end, it is pressing against the firing pin holder and through the T-head is trying to pull the trigger fork forward. However, the backward push against the top of the trigger fork is so much stronger than the pull on the fork center because of the longer leverage that the trigger fork must move back and the firing lock is ready again. The sleigh in which both the tube and recoil mechanism are housed recoils a distance of about 42 inches. Within the limits of that distance, the recoil mechanism slows down and cushions the force of the charge and returns the howitzer to battery. Here is a model of the recoil mechanism with all the major units represented. This is the howitzer tube. Beneath it is the recoil cylinder and above it, the counter-recoil cylinder. The two cylinders are connected by ports drilled through the front yoke of the sleigh. In both cylinders, there is oil heavy enough to offer great resistance when forced through narrow openings in the mechanism. Watch how the action of this oil and the reaction of the nitrogen gas are employed to do the work of the recoil mechanism. When the weapon is fired, the cylinders are driven to the rear with the howitzer. The piston rod is fastened to the cradle and remains stationary. So the rearward movement of the cylinders forces the oil ahead of the piston through the ports in the front yoke into the counter recoil cylinder. Here the oil is forced through one-way valves and next through a throttling ring. The diaphragm, pushed back by the inrushing oil, pulls a tapered control rod back with it, gradually closing the passage through which the oil is flowing. The oil that gets through presses the diaphragm back against the oil reserve and the floating piston, which can only move back by compressing the nitrogen gas. In doing so, the remaining energy of recoil is finally exhausted. Now the compressed nitrogen gas takes over and counter recoil starts. The gas expands against the floating piston, driving the oil back into the recoil cylinder. The one-way valves are closed, and the oil is compelled to return through the central bore of the regulator body, bypassing the cylindrical head of the control rod. It flows through two tapered grooves, which gradually decrease in depth. Thus, the head of the control rod, as it moves forward, causes the oil to pass through smaller and smaller channels. Finally, the grooves end altogether, and the head of the control rod shuts off the flow of oil, returning the piece to battery without shock. Now that we know what goes on inside the mechanism, let's see what happens outside. Let it be repeated that the force of recoil is used up in the hard work of pushing the oil through narrow openings and in gas compression. And the shock of counter recoil is eased away by tapering off the flow of oil returning through the regulator body. Friction of packings and moving parts adds to the action of braking, both in recoil and counter recoil. And there is one other aid to buffing the howitzer back to battery in the final stage of counter recoil. Aiding the smooth return to battery is a device known as the respirator. The respirator is simply a one-way air valve mounted in the head of the recoil cylinder. It is punched with three holes. And may be rotated until the holes are opposite a larger opening in the respirator body. In recoil, suction opens the one-way valve and draws air through the respirator. At the end of recoil, spring pressure closes the valve. 
When the piston returns, the trapped air is compressed to form a cushion. The rate of escape is governed by the number and size of the holes allowed open. Maximum buffing action is obtained when no holes are open. The howitzer is returned to battery by the pressure of the floating piston action against the oil column. The oil reserve between the floating piston and the diaphragm transmits this pressure to the rest of the system. If there is no oil reserve present, the floating piston will come to rest against the diaphragm and stationary regulator body before the howitzer has been fully returned to battery. An oil index at this end of the counter recoil cylinder indicates whether or not there is sufficient oil reserve in the mechanism. This is the oil reserve in front of the floating piston. Secured to the floating piston is the oil index control rod. The end of this small rod bears against the upper rack. Normally, the oil index is forced outward by the internal pressure in the recoil mechanism. However, when the oil reserve is diminished, the oil index control rod pushes against the upper rack, rotates the pinion, and pulls the oil index inward. In other words, the position of the oil index is determined by the amount of oil reserve present. Correct oil reserve, which is necessary for smooth action during firing, is indicated when the oil index is flush with the front head, and low oil reserve when the index is in the reseated position. The oil index will not register an excess of reserve oil. After firing, when the recoil mechanism has eased the howitzer into battery, the empty cartridge case is ejected by opening the breech block smartly. The extractor pries the empty cartridge case out of the chamber. The extractor is a flat plate with a bottom trunnion that fits into the floor of the breech recess. The top trunnion rides in a groove cut in the bottom face of the breech block. On one end is a lip, which, when the breech block is closed, fits in behind the edge of the cartridge case. After the breech block is opened far enough to clear the empty cartridge case, the extractor is swung around sharply, flipping out the case. And that completes a cycle of operation. Now the howitzer is ready for loading and firing again. It is a simple, rugged weapon with a range in elevation which enables it to lob high explosive shells almost seven miles. Or using fixed high explosive armor piercing ammunition to operate in direct fire like a gun. It's an infantry supporting weapon that can be adapted to any battle emergency. <laughs>